I'm certainly happy that our God is. Kevin frantically worrying up there, but everything's good now. <laughs> and for those who are watching online, I said, I am very thankful that our God is alive today. I'm happy that you are with us today. We have visitors and we're so blessed and honored to have you with us and hope that you'll come back anytime you have the opportunity. You know, God has truly blessed us once again to be able to be in His presence to worship Him. I hope, trust, and pray that our teaching and our preaching today will be with the words of the Apostle Paul and the power of Almighty God. Paul says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. I come to you today with no knowledge of any bad news or really any news of any kind today of, of anyone here. And if I should say something today that strikes you, and you yourself will say, well, he's preaching at me. I want you to know that that is not the case today. Because I'm like the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1. I've determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And let's put it this way. If, if something you do or something you believe is mentioned in our, our, our sermon today, I want you to know that it's purely coincidental. I didn't come today to, to try to step on your toes. I didn't come today with any ulterior motives. I'm simply here today to preach to you the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the gospel is designed that way, that if it's preached in the right way, it's going to affect someone. If it's preached in the right way, the gospel of Christ was designed to hit you in the heart. And as we're going to see in just a few minutes from the scripture that Milt read to us, when that is done, when the gospel is preached properly, it pricks your heart, it cuts your heart, and it makes you ask a question. The question that they asked was, men and brethren, what must we do? The Apostle Paul writes in the book of Hebrews, if we assume that he is the writer, chapter 4 and verse 12, the word is, of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ, this book that we call the Word of God, the book of books, the Bible, this book knows those of you who want to do right, and those of you who don't want to do right. It knows what you are thinking right now about God. It knows what you are thinking about yourself. It knows what you are thinking about me. And so you might as well smile. Let's be happy to be here today. I hope as I preach today that someone will learn something that will draw them closer to God. Do you realize that all of us are headed in some direction? All of us are either headed towards heaven or towards hell. There is no middle ground. Those are our only two destinations. Some people in this audience this morning might say to their self or to me, Preacher, I don't know where I'm headed. And friends, if you don't know where you're headed today, I'll just say you are in trouble. We're all either headed to heaven or to hell. And so to, today, as I preach to you, my, my preaching is not going to be with the words of man's inspiration. I hope to use strictly the Word of God to establish our facts and for our understanding this morning. There's somebody here tonight, or today possibly, who is not a member of the body of Christ. There might be somebody here today who has never been baptized for the remission of sins and you believe that you are on your way to heaven anyways. But I am here to tell you today with all of the love that I can muster in my heart that if you have not been baptized for the remission of sins, if you have not obeyed the gospel plan of salvation that we preach week in and week out, you are not on your way to heaven. That's plain and simple. I know that because Jesus says in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto me but by the Father. Notice he didn't say that there are multiple ways. He said there is one way and that he was that way. And so in order to go to heaven, 
you must have that way. In order to go, you must have the way. In order to know, you must have the truth. In order to have eternal life, you must have Him who is eternal life to go to heaven. You know, some people in our world today, and especially in our religious society, they want their salvation, they want their religion, and they want their church to be the way they get their food at Burger King. You know what their slogan is, right? Have it your own way. And they claim that when you come to them with a special order, you want it your own way, that that's no problem. But friends, religion and the church of our Lord Jesus Christ was never designed to be that way. You cannot have religion your own way. Because to have salvation today, Jesus tells us that you must be in Him. That is, in Christ. And there's only one way to get into Jesus Christ, And we're going to show you that in our lesson today. Now, since men are trying to get to heaven, and we we assume that everyone loves God and, and everybody wants to go to heaven, but the problem is we're trying to go in our separate and our own different ways. That's why we have a church down the road here, just across the interstate. And we have another church down the road. You turn the corner, there's another church. You go this way, there are two or three churches. You go down south of the river, there are a multitude of different churches. And you know what? They're all claiming that they are teaching the truth. They're all claiming that they will get you to heaven, but they're all teaching something different. Now, I don't know about you, but that strikes a nerve in me and makes me question what is being taught especially when we go back and consider again what Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6, that there is only one way. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 3, that we are to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God. We all believe in the one God, We all believe in that one faith, supposedly, even though we don't all practice that one faith. We say to one another sometimes, you have your faith, I have my faith. But I want to tell you, friends, there's only one faith that will save a person. And that is a faith that works by love. That's why James says in James chapter 2 and verse 17, faith without works is dead being alone. And so don't tell me today that you have all kinds of faith and that you want to receive Christ into your heart and that you love Him and you know that He's in your heart and that that saves you. Because according to James, that faith, that faith must show itself in faithfulness by working in love. Now you may have noticed in our bulletin this morning, the title of the lesson is This, That, and the Other. And in this lesson... We're going to look at each one of those words, this, that, and the other. You'll see where we're going in just a minute. You know, all of those who claim to know God who are not in the church that Jesus died for are trying to get to heaven by doing that, this, that, and the other. Have you ever said that to someone? I know my mother calls me sometimes. She says, son, what have you been up to? I said, oh, you know, this, that, and the other. (laughs) You ever said that? And some people are are, are having their religion that way. They're trying to get to heaven by doing this, that, and the other. But that simply doesn't work. Some people are trying to pray to heaven. Some people are trying to call on Jesus to get to heaven. Some people are are waiting for the baptism of the fire and and the Holy Ghost. Some people are waiting for for, uh, the Holy Ghost to come and lay on them and and so they can speak in tongues and, and pick up deadly serpents. And friends, much of that is found in the Bible, but the way that we practice and do those things today is very perverted. Some people claim to speak in tongues. And people who speak in tongues, what they don't tell you is they probably learned it from somewhere. They either learned it in their household or perhaps in a school or perhaps they visited a foreign country and and lived there and they were assimilated into that. So if you speak in tongues, it's not a miraculous thing today. You learned it somewhere. You picked it up somewhere. I can speak in tongues. Buenos dias. Como estas? Anybody in here know what that means? Good morning. 
How are you? That's a tongue. A, a tongue is a language. But you know, the, 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 where the religious world has gone wrong is this. They don't interpret their tongue. When the Bible clearly tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians that if we're going to speak in tongues, that there must be an interpreter. And let the record show that I did interpret my tongue this morning. Friends, we can't get to heaven by doing this, that, and the other. Remember, as we go through our lesson this morning, that Jesus said, I am T-H-E way, the way. Jesus, when He was about to go back into heaven, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. As Jesus was about to go back into heaven, He calls His apostles unto Himself, and I want you to listen to the words that Jesus speaks to His apostles. In Luke chapter 24, boy, that is a beautiful sound. Hearing those pages turn. I appreciate that so much. But in Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 44, I want you to notice again what Jesus says to His apostles. He said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you all the, all the while while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. You know, Jesus is no Johnny come lately, as we might call him. He was here before the foundations of the world were laid. He was written about in the prophets, in the law of Moses, and in the Psalms. Everything in the Old Testament pointed toward Jesus. And you'd be hard-pressed, if you could do it at all, to find a book of the Bible that doesn't mention Jesus in some way, shape, or form. Hardly a book at all does that. And so these are the words, verse 44, that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things might be fulfilled which were written by the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Verse 46 says, Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name in all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And that's what I want to do to you this morning as Jesus told His disciples to go out into the world and preach repentance and remission of sins. I want to preach that to you this morning. Is that okay, church? Repentance and remission of sins. This, that, and the other. I want to tell you this, something this morning and that is this, that in order to be saved, you need to hear this. What I'm about to tell you. This. You need to hear this. In the second chapter of the book of Acts, as Milt read for us so good this morning, verses 29 to 39, but in the second chapter of the book of Acts, hope you'll turn there and follow along because we're going to go through much of the chapter. But you need to hear this. Acts chapter 2, drop down to verse 37. We'll look at this sermon and make some comments about it, point some things out to you. But after Peter preaches this sermon, verse 37 says, Now when they heard, what? This. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what must we do? And so they heard something. They heard this. Well, preacher, what is this? This is that which Peter spoke to them in the earlier part of chapter 2. That's what we're going to deal with. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. Now, some people when they, they talk about religion and they talk about the heart, you may have heard people say, I've got Jesus in my heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. Jesus come into my heart. And all the while they're pointing down here. And I know that that's not the heart that was cut here in Acts chapter 2. That is the mind. I know that because if they were cut in this heart, they should have called 911. But that's not what they did. They were cut to the heart, and so they asked a question, men and brethren, cut to the heart, and ask a question, men and brethren, what must we do? This is the heart. This is the heart, and, and a lot of people get the two mixed up and confused. So when you say, hear somebody say, I know I've, what I've got in my heart, Jesus is in my heart, blessed are the pure in heart, that's the wrong place to pat. That's because the inspired writer, and even Jesus himself says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. 
where Jesus said, why do you think evil in your heart? It's the mind, it's the thinking process of man that we're dealing with. And so when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, their mind. It bothered them. So they said, men and brethren, what should we do? Anytime a person gets pricked in their hearts, cut, in, cut to their heart, their mind gets upset, something challenges their thinking and their attitude, they usually ask a question. Ask a question about it and, and, and something that they heard because the Bible says that they heard this. And whatever the this is, it cut them to the heart. It pricked them in their hearts. And it caused them to ask this question. Now let's go back to verse 1 of this chapter and let's see what they heard. Now when they heard this, verse 1 of Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now this is the apostles along with the 120 brethren who had come to them in the upper room. Because Jesus had told them in Luke chapter 24 that we read, if we would have continued reading, we would have seen Jesus tell them to go and wait in Jerusalem. Actually, that's in Acts chapter 1. To wait in Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit would fall on them. So we come to verse 2. They're therefore waiting there in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, which is 50 days after Passover. And verse 2 says, Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now who is this talking about? It's talking about the apostles of Jesus Christ. For He told them that. He promised them that they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that. Now, verse 4 through 6, They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. There were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the sound of them speaking in other tongues, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in His own language. Now that's a key point that I want you to take away this morning. And that is this, that a tongue is nothing more than a language. And the tongues that we hear people speak in today is nothing but a bunch of gobbledygook that couldn't be interpreted if someone tried. And they say, well, it's, it's a tongue, it's an unknown tongue, but it's not. A tongue is simply a language, a language is a tongue. And so we see the crowd gathering together and they were all amazed and they said amongst themselves, how is it that we hear all of these people speaking in different languages but we hear them in our own language? They were confused and amazed by this. Drop down to verse 11. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to, to one another, What could this mean? Others mocking said, They are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk which you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. And as they counted time then, the first hour of the day was 6 a.m., so hour number three of the day, we're at 9 o'clock a.m. Peter looks at the people and said, No, that's foolishness. Nobody's going to get drunk at 9 a.m. in the morning. They're not drunk as you suppose. And he's about to tell them what's fixing to happen. Look at verse 16. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So he's about to tell them what's going on. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your, your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. On my maid ser men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my Spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, and before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And people use that very last verse there that we read, verse 21, and they say, see here, all you have to do is call on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. But I heard the Apostle Paul tell us in the book of Romans chapter 10 that you cannot call on somebody that you've not heard about and you can't hear unless you have a preacher. 
And so sometimes you need somebody who, as the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, can come to you and rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. That's what Paul says. You can't call on somebody that you don't believe in. You can't believe in somebody that you've never heard of, and you can't hear it unless somebody else knows about it and tells you. Now you can pick it up and you can read it for yourself because we have the Word in its complete and inspired form today. But sometimes you need somebody to help you with it. You can't go calling on God like you want to do it and expect to be saved. Somebody has to help you along the way. Therefore today we see that when these men came together, Peter says, whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he begins to explain this to them. Look at verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by lawless hands have crucified and put to death. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Hmm. Let's think about this. God raised Jesus from the dead because David said it wasn't possible that death could hold Jesus. He couldn't be held in the grave by death because the wages of sin is death. Jesus never committed any sin, so He could not have died eternally. He didn't die for Himself physically, but we need to thank God that in that crowd we were yet sinners and Christ died for us. That's why He died. He died for someone other than himself. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. John 13 and verse 35. You cannot be claimed to be a friend of Jesus if you don't do what he says. Now as we go on, we're trying to find out what it is that they heard. So let's pick up in verse 25. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Then he says in verse 29, Milt, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Hmm. What about that? You know, the Muslims believe in Muhammad. And I want to tell you today that if you know someone, or even if you believe in Muhammad today, that he is both dead and buried. You can go to where he's buried and you can see his tomb. Some people might believe in Buddha. And Buddha, if he ever did live, he is dead and buried. And, and you could probably go and see his tomb. Not Jesus. Not Jesus. Jesus wasn't like that. Look at verses 30 through 32. Therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body according to the flesh he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in Hades nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus... God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. And so, he told them that they had killed Jesus. That they were responsible for crucifying him. But, in the midst and in spite of all of that, God raised him up from the dead. Now this is important. Because in verse 33, listen to what he says. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received the promise from the Father of the Holy Spirit, He poured out this which you now see and hear. He's talking about what happened in the first part of this chapter. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, poured out the things that they were seeing beginning to happen. It was because of Jesus. Are we getting it? This is Peter preaching to them. Verses 34 through 37. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, verse 36, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, 
they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what should we do? You see, that Jesus that they crucified was made both Lord and Christ. The same Jesus that was not in the grave, who couldn't be held in the grave. The same Jesus that David spoke about to these people. Through the Psalms and the prophecies. God raised Him up. God made Him to be Lord and Christ. What's happening? Jesus is dying on the sins for the cross, or for the sin. Jesus is dying on the cross for the sins of the world. And so they cry out, men and brethren, what must we do? What shall we do? Well, what does Peter say to them? They're cut to the heart. And it's obvious they want to know, how can we remove this awful deed that we've done? How can we take care of it? Then Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is to you, to your children, to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. I want to tell you tonight, that if you, or today, if you've not been saved, if you've not been baptized for the remission of sins, as Peter told the people here to do it, you are in a lost state. You haven't done what Jesus said to do. Jesus told Peter to preach when He gave him the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Peter tells the people to repent and be baptized on more than one occasion. Look at verse 40. This is important. Sometimes we, we don't go this far, but this is important. With many other words, He testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. That's how I know that Peter is talking to them about salvation. That's how I know that when they said, Men and brethren, what must we do? Essentially the question is, how can we be saved? Because Peter tells them in the following verse, Be saved from this perverse generation. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. That's what we're talking about. Now when they heard this, that's the this. Let's think about that. Our other two points will go by very quickly. Let's think about that. Look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and the verse is about verse 16. Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. Paul tells the brethren in Rome, Know ye not that to whom you present yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey? whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Verse 17, But God be thanked that though you were the slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered to you. Now if you're using a more modern version, the wording is probably a little bit different. But if you're using an older version, this is what it says. God be thanked that you were the slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And so they obeyed that. When they heard this in Acts chapter 2, we come to Romans chapter 6 and we find out that they obeyed that. That form of doctrine. Well, what's a form? Anybody in here a seamstress? Anybody raise your hand? Nobody's a dressmaker? Connie does a little bit. How about a builder? Glenn, I know you, you were a builder at one time and probably familiar with blueprints. Have you ever done any sewing? You, 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 you've looked at a pattern before. Those are forms. And if you follow that form, you get what's contained in the form. So what is Paul talking about here to the brethren in Rome? To find that form of doctrine, we have to go back to the first part of chapter 6, where he says in verses 3 and 4, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death. Now this is a form. He's talking about the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And he says if you want to be saved, you have to obey that form of doctrine. Verse 4. We were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so Peter, or Paul says to them, excuse me, 
You have to die just like Christ died. You die to sin. You die to yourself. And once you're dead, you have to be buried because that's what you do with a dead body. You don't just throw it on top of the ground and sprinkle some dirt on it. No, you bury that body. He says, well, how do you be buried? In the watery grave of baptism. You die to sin like Jesus died for sin. Then you are buried with Him into His death through the watery grave of baptism. And then when you come up out of that grave, you walk in a new life just like Jesus Christ did. Isn't that a beautiful picture? You obey that form of doctrine. You hear this, what Peter told them, but you obey that form of doctrine. What about the other? Seeing this and that, what about the other? Let's look at Galatians chapter 1. This, is, be real, this will be real quick as well. Galatians chapter 1 beginning at verse 6. Paul writing to the churches of Galatia. Many different churches in the area of Galatia. They had heard this, that which Peter spoke to them on the day of Pentecost. They heard that. Because many of them from those area churches and cities were present on the day of Pentecost. Go back and read it and see for yourself. So they heard this and they had obeyed that form of doctrine found in Romans chapter 6. What about the other? Look at verse 6 where he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from Him who called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Which is not another. But there be some that would trouble you and pervert the gospel of Christ. But I say unto you that even if we or an angel from heaven come and preach a different gospel than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. As I said before, so now I say again, if any man come and preach to you any other gospel than that you have heard, let him be accursed. So you see the other. They obeyed this, they heard that, and he says, leave the other alone. Don't fool with that. You see, the teachers were coming into the Galatian churches and saying, you need to come back under the law of Moses. That's much better than what Jesus did. Jesus wasn't the Messiah, they would tell him. Come back and live under the law of Moses. But uh, Paul says to them, no. Somebody comes and they preach that to you, you leave it alone or you become accursed. There's not another gospel. There's one way to get to heaven through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In conclusion, we've learned to hear this, to obey that, and to leave the other alone. And if you repent and be baptized, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, where He said the promise is to you, to your children, to all who are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God will call. Then what? You obey that form of doctrine that was delivered to you, being buried with Him by baptism into death, rising up out of that grave to walk in newness of life. Then you leave the other alone. Friends, you've heard this morning what was preached on the day of Pentecost. You've seen what they obeyed on that day. You've heard the, inst- the, the instruction is, is to do with anything else that people try to tell you about going to heaven. You leave it alone. And if you do that today, God will save you and you can live eternally with Him in heaven. Oh, there's only one way to glory and that's through Jesus Christ and through His Word. There's only one way to glory and that's through the church that Jesus built. Are you a part of that church this morning? The Bible tells us when you hear this and when you obey that, God will add you to His church. You don't join it, you're added to it. And then you can go to heaven. That's what we need to do. And if you're not ashamed of it this day, you need to come down this aisle as we sing the invitation song. Take hold of my hand. We'll take your confession of Christ and we will immerse you for the forgiveness of sins and you can be saved today. Maybe you've done that. Maybe you find that you've wandered off of that path. Maybe you, you, you are, are living a life of sin and, and you once again are separated from God because of that sin. Well, you need to come this morning as well, remembering that those sins put Jesus on the cross in the first place and that you died to that and buried that man. Repent of those sins. Put that man back in the grave and you too can again be saved. If you have a need this morning, let it be known while we stand and sing. On behalf of the Lawnville Road Church of Christ, I want to thank you for joining us today for our worship. If you ever have an opportunity, we invite you to join us at our physical location at 1301 Lawnville Road, 
here in Kingston, Tennessee. We hope you'll take the opportunity, if you ever get it, to come and experience the simplicity of New Testament Christianity, to learn about God, and to become a part of His family. If you have questions, if you would like to learn more about the Bible, or if you would like to have a home Bible study, feel free to contact us by calling 865-717-0444. Or for more information, please visit our website, www.lawnvillerodcoc.org. Again, we thank you, and we hope you have a blessed day.